The importance of Nani Babakwe is the fact that we are still talking about her. That her legacy is uh, projects like the Moccasin Identifier, like the work that's being car carried forward by land defenders and um, uh, Indigenous people today. Um, she is part, she, she reminds us that this is not something that's just happening now, that Indigenous people throughout their history have been fighting uh, a colonial system, have been, rem have been reminding a system about their inherent rights, have kept the covenant chain, have, have kept hold of their end of the covenant chain, even though um, non-Indigenous people um, have let go. The Covenant Chain is the oldest relationship, non-Indigenous and Indigenous relationship uh, in this continent. Um, treaty relationships uh, predate, obviously, Europeans. They weren't created for Europeans. They existed uh, uh, amongst Indigenous nations since time immemorial. And when Europeans came over here, they became an effective mechanism uh, to build relationship with non-Indigenous peoples because there is the, the differences between the two civilizations were so great language, time, space, relationship to land, all of those things are, are so different. And so um, indigenous people had this wonderful mechanism to engage with other civilizations that allowed for such difference, but allowed for um, connection between the two. And uh, the first one comes in with the covenant chain. That, uh, it comes in between the Dutch and between the Haudenosaunee. Um, in around 1613. This gets picked up by the English in um, around 1667, 1669, uh, when the Dutch are evicted from the continent and the English become the dominant colonial force in this area. But again, only for the settlers, of course, not for the indigenous folks. But the English crown recognized the importance of the relationship with Indigenous people, the trading relationship, but also the interpersonal relationships that were developing um, with the Haudenosaunee, and so they picked up the covenant chain. And they, it was the English that create the, the term silver covenant chain. Silver is bright, it needs to be polished. Um, the metaphors fit really well within the diplomatic language required by treaty in, in an Indigenous um, diplomatic um, space. Uh, Nani Babakwe travels over to England. Um, she'll reference the covenant chain uh, be because that was the, the foundation of that relationship. That's what would allow such a meeting to happen. And uh, the monarch uh, understood that. but there was a shift that was happening within the colonial figures that were surrounding the monarch at the time. And uh, we're seeing, we, we, be, we see a real erosion of that going on. And I think Nani's meeting in 1860 really, um, really highlights what is going on within colonial society, and in particular around the need for land. The Mississaugas of the Credit Mission, as Toronto grew and grew and grew, and, and this floodgate of settlers started arriving, they realized that their 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 day-to-day -day life was being threatened. And so um, a decision is made in 1847 to move the, um, the settlement and to leave the Credit Mission. And that's where, um, that's how they end up at the new credit, uh, Mississaugas of the, of the where, they, where they currently are just outside of, um, of Hagersville. And until she was married and moved from Toronto, Port Credit, into Saugeen, and then moved to buy land up there around Collingwood, that uh, there was restrictions. And they say that she would have been uh, 
<clears throat> a woman who did all the right stuff for the colonial way. You know, she got married. She, you know, was the wife of a, a Methodist minister. She had children, looked after all of them. And that uh, um, to realize that she wasn't going to be able to be an owner of land like her uncle had fought to be, uh, that her nation would own land or her nation of people would own land that uh, she become in her, I think being a woman, being a mother and being an advocate for her people to live a good life, she become a fighter uh, right down to, you know, petitioning the, uh, the queen, and understanding the process that you actually got to go to the, to England to visit the queen to get, uh, to see if you can change the law. Nani leaves the credit community and near Hagersville uh, and moves up to Nawash territory and um, joins the community there and is recognized as a member of that community. Um, she marries a man, uh, William Sutton, a non-Indigenous man, and uh, she wants to hold land up there. Um, in 1859, a council is gathered by the Mississauga Nation uh, and she's asked to travel to England to present yet another petition to Queen Victoria again asking for recognition of title under the British colonial system. Um, the result of this meeting is the Queen agrees um, and instructs the colonial secretary. But this, um, this instruction is denied by the Canadian government, um, who have now assumed total responsibility over the relationship with Indigenous peoples unilaterally. Um, they do give one concession, and that is that Nani's husband, William Sutton, is allowed to purchase the land under the fee simple, the colonial system. And so it's held in his name. Nani couldn't own land in, um, in colonial society because uh, women weren't recognized as, uh, as people within law. And so the colonial society that was establishing itself in what was then Upper Canada at the time, um, unlike the indigenous communities that they were attempting to displace, um, didn't recognize women's rights, didn't recognize women's rights to hold property, um, and uh, often treated them as property of their husbands. Um, and so, um, yeah, Nani was just within the colonial structure that was being um, imposed on the land. Uh, women as well were being displaced. Um, and. Um, and colonial women were being displaced as well. Settler women and, uh, were, were, were not being recognized within that. Um, I think um, an, interesting, an interesting question would be, if the covenant chain was actually recognized by the colonials instead of abandoned at that, that time or let go at that time, uh, the rights of women within the covenant chain relationship would have been much stronger and would have been affirmed as equals. And yet, by dropping the covenant chain, uh, the settlers were um, not only denying indigenous people their inherent rights, but they were denying women writ large inherent rights. She didn't change it, but she tried to. So I think that, you know, in her whole story about becoming an advocate, um, it comes from her connections to her uncle and her, um, Peter Jones was the son of the uh, a surveyor. I think there's lots of things in that life where she was connected to the land and the surveying and the ownership of it. When those two women uh, meet in 1860, uh, Nani presents the queen with a petition. And what Nani is asking for is um, recognition within the British political system, the British legal tradition, that the Mississaugas have rights to their land. They have inherent rights. The Mississaugas know that themselves. But what they're asking is, within your tradition, can you recognize our rights? The Queen agrees with this and instructs her colonial secretary to act on it. But what is also going around, uh, going on during this time is the Canadian government has passed legislation. And what that legislation says is from this moment on, the Queen must take advice from her Canadian ministers. And uh, their Canadian ministers will then advise the Queen, thus instructing the Queen 
to disregard um, this request. And this really lays the foundation for what's going to happen in Confederation with the total, um, Confederation totally disrupts treaty relationships because it takes Indigenous nations who are equals with the Crown and in the Canadian understanding places them under the federal government. And then we see full expression of this with the Indian Act. The taking of land and the other thing about the golf courses, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's strange that it's historic that that happens, that uh, where our villages were situated, have many have become golf courses and our stuff, our presence, our archeological evidence is underneath of those golf courses. By literally the place where she is born is a golf course. Um, and the place where she died was also turned into a golf course. But Nani persists because she, um, she's still there. She's in the center, the heart of the Cobble Beach Golf Resort. Um, and you're forced to contend with her. So even however many years since she's passed, she dies in 1865 and here we are in 2024, and she's still, still defiantly standing there, um, forcing us to, to, to contend with um, the fact that the, 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 the realities of Canada today, um, you can't shy away from it when you're standing there and you're, I've stood at her grave and looked up over the ninth hole of this golf course, over this manufactured land, a land that has been manipulated to meet the needs of a select few people who are privileged to, to be on that land, to play golf on that land. There's a lot to unpack there when you're standing there. And so, you're, so she's, still, she's still with us. And I think that that's a really powerful thing. Um, and I think that makes her one of the most extraordinary people on these lands. And when we, as all that we've learned about Nanny, I think we're still fighting the same battle. Yeah. And the uh, uh, moccasin identifier to what has evolved today is uh, very much about recognizing the treaties because it's the base of the colonial settlement in this continent. And that, uh, when we look to educate and make people aware that there's a treaty here and here's why, here's the law, and here's who the people are. Because I say the, the moccasin identifier is about the land and the people that live on it. So I think it's like very much the same fight.